Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to a special episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and I'm heading out to Western Colorado, where a friend of mine, Jackie Gusini, is finalist in the world's ultimate extreme huntress. Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Bruce, for having us. I really appreciate it. Well, and just to set the table right, you're from Louisiana, Everybody will hear your voice. They'll know you're from Louisiana. You're working out in the oil fields, Western Colorado, which is great. And how did you become an extreme huntress back in 2012? Let's go back and start that so we can bring everybody up to speed while it's important for them to vote before June 1st. The way I became an extreme huntress was many years ago, I grew up, I didn't have a lot of money, and I wanted to try different excursions on different hunts to go on. And I had seen that they had this hunt to submit your 500 word essay on your true passion about hunting. And so I submitted an essay on my true passion about hunting and I was chosen amongst 10 women. And then the, the U S voted on who they thought was the most extreme hunters back then. It was kind of more like a competition where people vote from essay who they thought was the most passionate hunter and compete here. And then what happened was I was chosen And I won that competition back in 2012, and I got to go to Zimbabwe, Africa, and hunt Cape Buffalo back then for a TV show called Eye of the Hunter. And that's how I kind of got to where I'm at. And the reason I got there was because I just, I had a passion for hunting and just being in the outdoors, and that was something that I really, really loved, and I really wanted to share to the world, and I've supported it since then, because I know how it changed my life forever, and that was just so important for me to be, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or anything in life. What's important is if you have a dream, you go after it, no matter what eight years. And here I am again <laughs> competing for the ultimate extreme hunters with four. Well, there's three of us, three other women I'm competing against. They're amazing women. So I'm going after again, and we'll be going back to Africa in July this year. Wow. So for the people who don't know it, extreme hunters is, is a contest for women all around the world. And last year, Eureka won it from Sweden. And in previous years, there's been a lot of people. But how did you become a finalist in the Ultimate Extreme Huntress? So for the Ultimate Extreme Huntress, again, it's our 10th anniversary for 2019. We're going to take four women, and the four of us were chosen, and the ones that were able to go at the time that they were going to be having the competition this year. And that's how I made the four. So it's Eureka from Sweden. Myself, Jackie from Colorado, a girl named Lindsay Christensen from Idaho, and Angie Tennyson from Montana. And all of us were previous of the Extreme Hunters competition. And we're going to bring this up a couple of times during the show, folks. Tell people where they can go to vote, and they have to vote by June 1st. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The first phase of voting is till June 1st, and then the second phase of voting is going to start October 26th until January And so that's going to be the second phase when all the episodes air. But the way that you go to vote, you go to ExtremeHuntress.com and you scroll down to the bottom of their website and then you can see the four finalists there. And I would like for you to vote for me, but you can vote for whoever you want to vote for. But we're all in it for the same reason. We're all winners already. And then you confirm your vote by entering your email address. And then you're going to receive an email from CrowdSignal to confirm that you are not a computer. Right. Everybody who votes, you have to confirm that you're a real person, basically. By That's correct. Yep. You'll get an email and you'll have to confirm that you're a real person. Now, so what does the first segment of voting do? Because the second part is in October. So are they going to eliminate somebody or... No, so the way that the voting works and the competition works is it's on 100%. You have 100% as your biggest score that you can make. So voting is like, I don't know the percentages exactly, but voting is like 25%. Your skills challenge is an additional 25%. The way the judges 
judge you is an additional 25% and how you hunt and how you present is an additional 25 to make a total of 100. And then so the voting will be a percentage of our score to meet the top of the level of 100. And whoever has the highest to 100% will be the winner that they're going to announce January 2020 at Dallas Safari Club. Right. And that's where I guess I'll give you a new trophy. Uh, yes, sir. That's what they're going to give a trophy. But the trophy is, I mean, it's more than just a trophy. Everybody's like, well, what do you win? What do you win? And it's not about winning. It's about this amazing opportunity, Mr. Bruce. All four of us are getting to the FTW branch in San Antonio, where we're going to compete at the military base there with Mr. Tim Fallon and his team. And then July 1st, all of us, plus the producers of the show and the judges, we all fly out and we fly to the Save Conservancy and Des Fontaine Safari is the hunting group that we'll be hunting with. But the biggest thing is we're going to be able to go out to the different hospitals and get to go out to the schools and be able to show the world that hunting is killing an animal. It's not just about going out there and hunting a trophy. It's about providing for other people and how important all of our dollars are. That is not just about, like I say, go and kill something. It's truly about all our money goes to different schools and hospitals and water wells and everything in Zimbabwe. And that's going to be the message that we're trying to deliver. And so to me, it's all expense paid. If nothing comes out of our pocket whatsoever, we, they pay for all of this. So that's a blessing. And then just the people we meet. I mean, it's so amazing to be able to like, I'm on the radio with you. And we get to meet so many people and network because all of us, no matter who you are, if you're a hunter or a fisherman or outdoors, we all have the same passion. Some of us just are a little bit different levels of it, but that's what we are. And that's what I think is important. So that's my trophy. That's how I feel. Folks hunting in Africa, taking trophies in Africa, being a woman who hunts in traffic in Africa is probably the most maligned segment of the hunting community that there is. Kirstie Pike, CEO of Proist Hunting at Pearl is a good friend of mine. And she shared with me some of the hate mail that she's gotten. And it, oh, yeah. you want to throw up, you go, well, that's, racist that's terrorist that's i mean it's just flat ugly and this is other women really against other women i mean and it's ugly and i as men i would never had that but women you get so attacked and so maligned for doing something on the conservation because ladies and gentlemen with option there's people in africa that would not eat that are hired by these outfitters and professional hunters and they get their protein, they get their food from the hunters because the hunters don't take the meat back. The meat goes to use for all the tractors and all the families in the surrounding areas. So when you think about that, everything's consumed and the hunter pays for it, which all the money goes into the local economy in Zimbabwe or wherever you're hunting. And it's a huge thing. And I'll just say this flat out. I don't see any anti-hunter going to Africa and feeding people building wells, supporting hospitals, supporting schools, building schools like the hunting community does. You don't do it. And you know, Mr. Bruce, you're exactly correct. And it's not even just in Africa. It's here as well. I mean, a lot of people, I feel in my opinion, that they don't realize that if we don't hunt and fish and continue to do what we do, we could lose that. I mean, that's a big thing that we have here because people act off of emotion nowadays. People don't understand that where do you get your food from? If you think about it, where do you get your food from? And for us as hunters and anglers, we have to decide, are we going to do it ourselves and be conservationists and provide food on the table? Or are you going to hire somebody to go kill an animal for you and go get your prime rib or your steak or your bacon or your chickens or whatever it is that you like and whatever it is that you eat? A friend of mine told me there's nothing happy about a Happy Meal from McDonald's. So you can make that choice as a person to go say, all right, I'm going to food on the table or I'm going to go pay somebody to kill it and go order me some steaks from the store. And I just don't think, in my opinion, like I said, people realize that hunters are providing for their families. Hunters are providing for other people. Our dollars that we spend goes to the roads and goes to the different waterways and goes to the properties and trails and everything else that people love to do and we don't do something about it as far as conservationists we could lose it because people it doesn't matter about how much scientific research we have it doesn't matter about anything like that most important thing with all that being said is people act off of emotion and they could shut it down like that doesn't matter what we have no matter what evidence scientific research that people act off of emotion and the scientific research doesn't matter. And one thing that I've seen 
is how organic food is becoming the craze and adult onset hunters is a growing part of hunting. Why? Because people are saying, especially women are saying, wait a minute, I can do that. I can accept that challenge and I can go to Alaska or I can go in my back 40 and shoot a deer, butcher the deer, process the deer, have the deer feed my family for a few months, and then they get the best food they possibly can get. It's organic, and they didn't have to go to the store and buy it. That's correct. They buy a license, which supports Parks and Wildlife. They buy a gun, Pitnam Robinson money, goes to conservation. So the whole hunters support hunting. And if you like to go, if you're a non-consumptive, I'll just say a birder, and you go out, take pictures of all the birds, the geese and the ducks and the eagles and the herons and all that, that's great. But you're not paying for those birds to be there. Guess what? If the hunters are, if they shoot ducks, if they shoot geese, then they're supporting that. So that's available for everybody. And people just, they miss that whole point. Those are my two cents. You got me going here, Jackie. Yeah, I don't mean to, but that's just something that I'm really passionate about because I provide for our family. And I'm not going to lie, like even like last year, Mr. Bruce, um, our freezer was really, really low and I had a cow tag and I was like, we have to get something. Like we got a whole family to feed and it was hard. Now I have plenty of food and plenty of elk meat that will get me until next season. And that's like all that we rely on as a family, no matter what it is that we're hunting, that's all meat in our freezer. Black buck jerky sticks to everything. I mean, I pack my lunch. I work in the oil field. You know, I don't have a microwave. So anything that I could take with me is great. And everything that we harvest, I mean, my little boy and I just harvested a turkey. So we're going to have a little turkey soup this week. That's what it's going to go in the crock pot. So everything we hunt, we eat. And that's just how we were raised and how we do it. You know, I'm kind of a Cajun. We cook out. We'll make a goldfish taste good. But (laughs) that's just how we are. We like to cook and take care of our family. Yeah, and I can appreciate that. Let's go back to the contest and tell people how to vote again, where they need to go to vote again. Okay, you go to ExtremeHunters.com. Scroll to the bottom. You'll see four of the contestants. Vote for Jackie Guccini or any of the other gals. Confirm your email through crowd signal once you enter your email address. And it's that simple. Two it's minutes. It's that simple. And the first part is worth 25%. So you need to vote by June 1st. That's and then right. let's give a shout out to Tom Opry, who started Extreme Hunters. So, Tom, we love you. Thanks for doing this. And you're helping hunting throughout the world. No question about it. Now, who are some of the judges on the show? The judges, actually, Olivia Opry. Do you know Olivia? No, I never met her. Actually, Olivia and I competed against each other back in 2011 before I won for 12. And then her and Tom fell happily ever in love and they got married. Good but for them. Olivia, yeah, so coincidentally. But Olivia's a Hunter's Diana winner. She's hunted a lot of animals all across the world. And so uh, she's a great person to have as a judge. And then Mr. Larry Wasoon. Mr. Larry, they call him in Texas Mr. Whitetail. He He's is Mr. Around. Whitetail. He yeah, is Mr. Mr. Whitetail. Whitetail. I've been working with Mr. Larry for seven years. I've had that great of an opportunity. And again, um, everybody's like, why do you support this? Why do you continue? It's because of the network and the people that I meet. We meet. I mean, Meadow. I meet Meadow and meet everybody that's ever competed I've got to meet and have personal stories and share that passion with. And that's so important to me because that's who I am. And there's only, what, 4% of hunters out there, 6% of anglers, I believe, if you do the research on it. That's not really a lot of people, if you think about it, compared to our world. So anybody that we can meet that loves us to do the same stuff that I do, I want to go ahead and meet them and share a story. By the way, you're quite a a fisherman. Now, do you catch those fish on the White River? I have caught the trout. The trout, no, I caught them in the Colorado River. And then the big old crappie, I was actually at the Wyo Ranch. This is a funny story. I'm doing it. That sucker was a slab, too. Yes. So at the Wyo Ranch and Mr. Byron Sadler, who's the owner, like the big dog, I'm like, hey, when the girls are competing, because they didn't need me, because normally I'm behind the scenes for extreme hunters. And I said, hey, can I go and fish in that pond over there? He's like, yeah, you're not going to catch anything. So here I am, I'm whipping out all those coffee. And I'm like trying to take selfies and everything. And then Mr. Byron goes, hey, were you catching that in my pond? I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, you're not allowed to fish in there anymore. (laughs) So. He had no idea those fish were in there, and I tore them up. It was so much fun. So when I left for the competition, I was fishing spinnerbait, lime truchu, and 
they had no idea. Them fish never seen nothing. They were eating everything that I threw out there. I loved it. <laughs> um, Good for you, girl. Yeah. In 2009, Mr. Bruce, and I lived in Louisiana before I was transferred up here. First woman to qualify to fish the Leaky Bass Classic in New Iberia, Louisiana. So, yeah. So, fishing's kind of my thing. I love it. It's, I love hunting, but I also love fishing big time. You're so passionate. I mean, you're passionate about the outdoors and What's your message to women out there, my women listeners, probably 30% of everybody listening to the show are women. And so what would you say to them? I would say to the women out there that don't listen to your husband or your boyfriend or anything. Come out here and have fun. It doesn't really matter what you know, what you don't know. If you have any experience or no experience, we could all network together to kind of do anything that you want to do. I help coordinate hunts. I help people who want to like find different hunting attire or people that want to go fishing somewhere with women groups and stuff. So the message I want to say is go out there, have fun. You only live once and it doesn't matter where you come from or what you know. There's so many people out there that can help. You can call me at any time and just chase your dreams, guys, because you never, ever know what can happen in life. And I would just really be sincere about chasing your goals, follow your dreams and enjoy everything that you can whenever you're given those opportunities. So what's your tagline? Tagline, live for the outdoors. Yeah, but it's different than that. Personal tagline. Wait a minute, I'll pull it up. Success comes to oh, those. Success comes to all those who never quit and never give up. Yeah. Never stop dreaming. And never stop dreaming. That's right. So that's my tagline on everything. Bruce, I grew up super poor. I know what it was like to struggle and I know what it was like to miss opportunity. But I haven't shared this story like in the public or whatever, but we were so poor growing up. I qualified for four events my senior year in track, and my parents couldn't even afford to buy me track shoes to match the rest of the team. And somebody donated and bought me track shoes so I can match the whole rest of the team my senior year. And I'm super fast, play college softball and stuff. But that's just an example of how poor we were. And so that tagline of success comes to those who never quit, never stop dreaming. I've just always held on to that because my daddy always told us, girl, you go after anything you want. doesn't matter anything that you want to do, you chase it. And nothing is never too big for you to accomplish it. And that's kind of what I've done and knowing where I came from and knowing where I'm at today. That's just really important to me because a lot of folks from my Southern town in Louisiana guys, I mean, we got hit by a lot of hurricanes and they're super poor there. But they're all happy, right? But they know how I grew up, and they see where we're at today. And that's just so special to me because it makes me so humble because I know the struggles, and I've kept chasing my dreams. And that's why it's important for me to just keep on and keep on going, I guess I should say. What do you think we can do to get more kids into the outdoors, not just hunting, but hunting or fishing or camping or riding horses or just getting them up into the West Elk wilderness and spending time up there? I think it's just a mess. It's not talked about a lot. They have the Garfield County Outdoors. You know, Clint Whitley is the guy who manages that here in our area. There's a lot of things like that, but I think it's just now upbringing. I mean, I know that, I don't know if you know Lisa and Donnell, they're over on your side of the slope over there. They do a few things, but I really feel like- Lisa have, and Donnell are- Yeah. Hunting divas. The Hunting Divas, that's yeah. right. So, hey, folks, check out the Hunting Divas on social media. They're the bomb. I mean, those ladies so, are incredible. So funny. I love those girls. They're awesome. And those are the things, like a lot of folks, we have social networking and stuff. But I really think for the kids, guys, I think we need to have places to go. I mean, we do have some areas here on the BLM and public land, but it's really so hard because everything's so far in distance. But if we could start them young somewhere, like on... I don't know, maybe private property or somewhere where we could take them out where they're in the woods and they get to experience that. But it's really hard to find because people hold on to their property on the private side. But yet on the public side, we have a lot of avenues, but it's super hard to try to get everybody together to do something. But what we're doing is something that we're going to be throwing out at the end of this year is my girlfriend, her and I, she has a little boy and I have a little boy. And we're going to do like moms and kids. Like we're going to have a big camping time we're gonna go fishing we might do archery we're gonna have a big little camping trip for moms and kids to take their kids out so we can all enjoy it together we can all like chase our kids around but also talk about hunting or fishing and those are some of the things we're gonna be putting on on this side of the slope so that way we can try to get more people involved because a lot of us have kids and I got a two-year-old fixing to be three you know how big of a hassle that is 
And so some people don't want to go hang out with a three-year-old girl. Other moms that have three-year-olds, we could chase them together. And so those are some of the things we're going to be doing here. And, you know, I, I help teach Hunter's Ed over here on this side. So that kind of helps. And uh, just having a community full of people, but just trying to network to get everybody in one spot, I think, is the biggest challenge. And thanks for that. One more time, how do people vote for Jackie? To vote for Jackie Guccini for the Ultimate Extreme Hunters, go to ExtremeHunters.com, scroll to the bottom of the website, pick Jackie Guccini, vote, confirm your email from CrowdSignal. And that's it, folks. I mean, Jackie, let's share some stories now. We've got the, the world's ultimate extreme huntress covered. Let's talk about some of the hunts and some of the, the fun things you've done or the adventures you've had. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you took what you were after or got what you were after, harvested it. But let's share some stories about your hunting and fishing experiences. Okay. Well, I'll start. My precious hunting experience was Sunday, actually. So turkey tag and turkey is my big passion to hunt. I don't know why I'm like, I'm kind of turkey crazy and I'm a big archery hunter and I just flew in from Texas because I had to go to work in Texas, got home late Saturday night because of the tornadoes. I'm sure y'all heard about them. And then Sunday, I'm a little boy and I'm like, buddy, mommy's going to go around a turkey today. And if you come with me, you have to be super quiet. And he's like, okay, mommy, I'll be super quiet. Well, I just bought him a little like pretend shotgun on Saturday when I was in Junction. I've been kind of watching the turkeys for a while, kind of know their pattern and stuff of what they're going to do. So I set up. We live on three acres at Waters BLM. And so I had my little boy with me and I knew the turkeys were coming down. I seen them at a distance and turkeys don't really go opposite direction, kind of stay on their pattern. So I go out there and I'm like, all right, buddy, you have to be like super quiet. Please don't pull the trigger because he has his little gun makes noises. And so I think at that, because I have a bow, my husband's gone. It's just myself and my little boy. And I'm like, I think he felt my adrenaline, Mr. Bruce, because he got all nervous and he's like holding on to my leg. And I'm like, buddy, just be very quiet. Don't say anything. He's like, hold it on like the whole time. And so I see these turkeys come down and I just drew back and I knew the yardage already because I've been, like I said, I've been patterning for a while and to harvest a really good tom. He's a beautiful, beautiful bird. I've harvested nine turkeys with my bow over the years and he's the prettiest bird I've ever hunted. And so my little boy was so excited and he feels like he shot it. So that was just so special to me because he was a part of the whole, like the whole process. And then we hiked all the way back down in the house, and I got my little turkey ruler to, to figure out how big he was. It took pictures, and then the funniest thing is, pretty bird, I'm going to take pictures. So I set up my tripod, and I'm putting my camera on, like, 10 seconds, and I'm running back to the turkey, and I'm trying to fan it, trying to tell my little boy to be still. And so it took about nine of those, like, 10 pictures at a time, but I finally got a few good ones. And so that just happened on Sunday, and so I'm tagged out. I'm super excited. And my little boy got to be a part of it. And so that was really inspiring to me because I wanted him to understand that that's pretty. And I mean, that's very important to us. And his big thing is, mom, are you going to put it in the freezer? Are we going to eat it? And I'm like, yeah, buddy, we're going to put it in the freezer. (laughs) And so the other thing about my little boy is his name's Chap. And I actually named him after my PH that I hunted with in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. So when I got to hunt in Africa, I hunted a Cape Buffalo. And that was a very exciting hunt. With your bow? Did you hunt with a bow or no, rifle? No, I hunted with a rifle with a 375 h and H. It was a blazer with 300 gram bullets. And boy, after I shot that puppy nine times, I felt like my teeth were going to fall out. Like, oh. it's ready to go. Yeah, it, it beat me up pretty good. But that was part of the Extreme Hunters. And that was a, such an amazing experience. Just to give you how much I love hunting, I actually postponed my wedding that year so I could go hunting in Africa. <laughs> so. <laughs> An understanding husband, that's for sure. He came with me that year, and so he was super excited. But that's some of the, those are two stories. And it's when I was well, tell us young, about the Cape Buffalo. Did you stalk him? Was a spot and stalk, or was that out of a blind? No, 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 no. We were in Zimbabwe whenever we hunted Cape Buffalo this go around in 2012. And the crazy thing is, day three, we were there for nine days. And day three was when o- Olivia and Tom had got married actually in Africa that year. And they were charged by a Cape Buff that they shot nine times and it kept coming at them. And they have it on, you could go watch it on YouTube on one of Tom's shows. And the buffalo slid to them. Like the PH came and had a rifle and shot and the buffalo luckily didn't charge, didn't gore them. 
but it split like three feet from them. So they're telling us this story on day three, and I'm still hunting Cape Buffalo. So day five came along. My husband actually, you could go watch all this on Extreme Hunters and on Eye of the Hunter on YouTube channel. But anyhow, it was very hot. We went in October. It was really hard work. It was a lot of spotting, stalking. Day five came along. My husband already had suffered heat stroke. The cameraman was struggling. And we went to Lake Kariba to go take a little nap and then kind of rest. It's a water hole there in Zimbabwe. And we were actually, we called the boat to come back and get us because it was a three and a half hour drive to go back to camp by truck, but an hour boat ride for them to come pick because we were exhausted. And so the boat was on its way to come get us. And then next thing you know, there's a huge herd of buffalo that are drinking at the lake. And we're like, oh my gosh, we got to get ahead of them. And so I tell you what, and you could go watch, like if you watch hunting shows, everything that's face forward is normally reenactments, but everything that's, if you see their butt or the back of people, that's true. And if you go watch that, you'll see that they're chasing, we're running the whole time. And so, uh, so anyhow, so we ran around like a circle to cut the buffalo off and they had this bull that was there and they're like, shoot, shoot, shoot. And you know, I'm like, I just sprinted for, it felt like probably 20 minutes, but it was probably only about 10 minutes. We got around and I made a shot. He was moving when I made a shot and I shot him. Everything in Africa faces you where I hunted. I never got a broadside shot on anything unless it was a second shot, but everything faced me in Africa. And so I shot him and I shot him in the shoulder and he kind of stumbled and then I lung shot him right after that and I could hear him and then went in the bush. And so we go out there and they're like, shoot him again. And the funny thing is that gun was so big. So I shot him the third time in the back of his ear. And they're like, shoot him again, because the way he was laying, it would have went through his ear and to his heart. And so when I went to shoot him again, I fell on my butt because I'm trying to squat down and use this big old gun. After fight, we wanted to make sure because buffalo have a tendency to come back and if they're wounded. They'll kill you. They yeah, want to kill you. you. They kill, I think, 200 people Black a year. Death. The Black Death. There you go. So anyhow, so that happened and he was gone and stuff. And then immediately right after that, here comes the whole town. Like, no. Town. The whole tribe is coming out. Mr. Bruce, they have machetes. And they're like, la, 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 la. And they're all like worshiping me and stuff because Free everybody. Meat. It's dinner time. It's dinner time. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So it was so crazy because, like, we just kind of had our people that were with us. But this was like, I'm telling you, like, coming out of the woodworks. I have no idea where they were coming from. Buckets on their head. And they go out there. They're shaking my hand and they speak. I know Jabula means water. Africans, I guess, I don't know what the language is, but I know Jabula means water because they kept asking me for water. So I would give them my water bottles because they're thirsty. And so anyhow, so they come there and they worship me a little bit and they're praising me because I just, I have food for them. And then I'm not joking. So we went back and we took some pictures and then we went and did a little reenactment. And uh, uh, when we got, You're shooting yeah, the that's right. Shooting the face for you. When we went back, Mr. Bruce, there is nothing left. Nothing. Nothing. Like, I'm not exaggerating. What's it? It's like if they took, like, if you know the intestines and they drained it, you know what I mean? That's all you saw. Nothing left for the lions or the coyotes or hyenas, whatever they have. Nothing left. They took it all in the way that it works there and in other countries as well, as far as in Africa. They have a game scout with free hunter that goes out there. And every piece of meat from different villages so say you hunt in one village and then you drive a few miles and you hunt somewhere else all that meat is donated per village so that way those people can have meat throughout the whole year and so in us hunters it's so true that we are really providing the food there because the natives are not allowed to hunt in those areas and so they were so excited and they were so thankful for us coming there to hunt because we just gave them all that food and I was so proud that and that's when I realized that I got to keep doing this like this is something and it makes me really emotional because we take for granted so much that we have here in America like where does our water come from I could drink a bottle of water right now and I could go get me some Oreos or whatever it is that I want but they don't have that there they don't know what it's like to experience that so like when I go I'm bringing candy, I'm bringing clothes, I'm bringing shoes because I know how to pack. I've been hunting for many, many years. And I'm going to bring them every single extra spot in my suitcase I can give to give to those kids and to give to those people because they are so thankful and blessed whenever we come there. So yeah, sorry, I get emotional about it because it was truly something that changed my life forever. 
And it goes back to why do I support extreme hunters? Why do I support Tom Oprey? Why do I support women in the industry? Because once you experience it, you'll be hooked for life. And the only way to, to continue people in this industry is for you to share your story with them and for you to show them or explain to them how we can make a difference. And so I get excited. Humbled what you just shared because that's the heart of a huntress. And there's no way you can replicate that. You have to be there. You have to face death. I mean, Cape Buffalo can kill you very easily. I had one friend, Bobby Fontana, got killed a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. A bull that had been, he got snared, and so it abscessed his leg, and so he just laid up in the bush, and they happened to walk by. Right, yeah. And he would just gourd and stomp within seconds, and it was over. Yep, and that happens a lot there. We've seen a lot of snares. We've seen a lot of poaching there, and... You know, the unfortunate part is it happens every single day. And we, and only thing you hear through social media is the negative part. You really, I mean, we, everybody has to know that. I mean, no matter who you are, I would think in the industry, I mean, they could, they could turn anything the way that they want to turn it. But a lot of people talk about trophy hunting and, and why would you go after a trophy and why would you go after a bigger animal? And that they don't realize things like that. Like whenever you get older and you get sick and you could get diseases and stuff. And so a lot of people go after bigger animals because you have to kind of keep the herd health healthy and stuff. And same thing in Africa, a lot of people are getting killed because of old animals or old elephants that come out there. And another thing that a lot of people don't realize is we don't know what it's like to have five elephant run through our field and eat all of our crops because that's what they're surviving off on. So they technically need to have hunters go out there. And that's why it's important for hunters to go out there because we as in hunters will pay that price, whatever it is for that elephant. And not only are we helping the ranchers and the subsistent farmers by their farm will not have to worry about being eaten up by elephants, but yet at the same time, we'll be able to provide food if we would hunt or harvest that animal as well. And that's for a buffalo or any animal that they have there. And Mr. Bruce, I learned is in North America, you got our mule deer and our whitetail and our elk and our moose and bison and our sheep, our mountain goat, so on and so our bears, so on. And I could keep going on. People, I think, don't realize that they don't have those animals in Africa. Their animals are their lions and their elephants and their kudu and their impala and their cape buffalo and hippos. Like, those are their species of animals and we have our species of animals in our country. And so when people see a zebra being shot or an elephant, only thing they could think about is, hey, I've seen that in a zoo. That's so horrible. But yet they don't look at a whitetail or a bear being a bad thing because that's what they know here. But a people in, like, in our country don't realize that those are their animals. They don't look at a zebra as a horse. They look at it as a piece of meat. And so that's another message that I think people should educate themselves on because they don't have a bear there. They don't have an elk there. They have, what, 82 species of animal, I believe, they have in Africa. Their, our elk is like their kudu. So I think that's super important for people to understand that, yeah, you see people with these different animals and stuff that they're hunting there, but that's their species just like we have our species. Does that kind of make sense? Well said. Yeah. One thing I want to share to any of us in the industry, this is kind of important to me as well. And I'm learning this as I get older with social media is that going back to the elephant situation, Mr. Bruce, is that it could take me 30 minutes to explain to you how important it is about conservation in Africa or conservation here in America, how important it is to hunt that animal and to harvest that animal. But it only takes one second of you watching a video of a bad shot or something being wounded to make that change in your brain, to make that have a negative feeling again. So I think us as hunters and anglers, we should really think about that whenever we're posting and stuff and try to educate folks that it's not just about a kill. It's really about more than that. Just like you said, sharing your passion and your stories and stuff. That's We take so much of that for granted. But that's, I think, a message us as hunters and anglers should try to show to folks because it acts off, people act off of emotion, and it doesn't matter how much scientific research we have. They could take it away in a second. 
Well said. And with that, we're going to wrap up this special episode for the world's ultimate extreme hunters. Jackie, thank you so much for being a guest. And let's do it again. I'd love to hear you. And you have a heart of a hunter. And I'm sure you've read some of Robert Rorick's books about Africa and Chapstick about Africa and all the the people. uh, Theodore Roosevelt went to Africa and and helped establish some of the hunting preserves. Yeah, the Boone and Crockett Club. Mm -hmm. And there's so much history that hunters have done in Africa to provide. And that's a message that I know you and Tom and Olivia and Larry are getting out and I just wish you well in the contest and I can't wait to you to be a guest on the show again. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Bruce, for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, my dad used to call me La Bouche and in French, it means the mouth because I never stopped talking. So you could call me at any time and I would love to have, hear some stories for both of us, even if it's not on the radio or anything. Because <laughs> I just love to talk and hear stories because that's what I enjoy. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.